So if you have a 30-year-old house and it is starting to show wear and tear and all kinds of problems, but you cannot af uh, yet afford to build a new house, what will you do? Well, to stop it from getting worse and continue to have a place to live, uh, it is time to fix it up. Uh, maybe give it a new coat of paint, uh, replace some drafty windows, or upgrade some electricals and plumbing, and, and so forth. So the SCRD's zoning bylaws 310 is also 30 years old. Um, it has got almost 200 amendments over the course of its life. Uh, many of its regulations are getting outdated out of alignment with current legislations and policies and less effective for the current condition of the Sunshine Coast and also difficult to use. Um, it would be ideal to have a brand new bylaw, like a brand new house. But before we can do that, um, it is important that in the interim, we tackle major issues and do some updates and housekeeping in order to maintain a functional bylaw in place to guide ongoing development. So that's basically what bylaw 722 is all about. So, but keep in mind though, um, bylaw 722 is not going to change land use zones or, or zone boundaries. Um, it is not changing the subdivision districts and boundaries. Um, it is not changing the general framework of density, um, such as partial size thresholds that control the number of dwellings. And it is not going to change the size specific zonings that um, is already in place. Um, the project began in 2018 and continued on to 2019 uh, with two phases of public engagement uh, venues, um, including workshops, information meetings, online surveys, and so forth. Um, from 2020 to 2021, uh, we focused on putting all the public feedback together and drafting the new bylaw. And this year, the new bylaw is ready to move forward to the final, uh, to formal adoption process, which began with the first reading uh, of the new bylaw uh, by the board in May. Um, now we are in the second phase of this process, which is to present the bylaw to the community and referral to agencies for comments. And here are some of the highlights of what is new in bylaw 722. So through the previous public consultation, the community asked us to look at opportunities to address urgent needs. Um, you asked us to provide more housing options and remove building design barriers. Um, you wanted to be able to work from home and you wanted to uh, build energy efficient buildings and adapt to climate change. And you wanted um, more clarity on cannabis production and retail. And you wanted to grow your own food in your backyard. So here is what we came up with. Um, so the bylaw tries to provide a fuller range of housing choices from, big, uh, from small to big. Um, a new housing option secondary suite up to a size of 55 square meters would be allowed in any single family dwelling. Um, this sits at the small end of the housing uh, range. For the mid range, the auxiliary dwelling will continue to be allowed and the size will move up a notch from 55 square meters to 90 square meters. Um, it can be attached to any building, such as a garage, creating a carriage house. And the design barrier of um, six meter minimum building widths is removed to allow more flexibility in building design.
the Sunshine Coast um, is known to be a place of many home-based businesses. And through the pandemic, the trend of working from home is getting stronger. The bylaw recognizes the importance of the home-based business in supporting the vitality and diversity of the local economy. So home-based business is permitted um, in, uh, in, the, in the new bylaw is uh, permitted in most zones where um, there is a residential use, um, but subject to an updated uh, regulations to control and maintain the neighborhood characters. And to grow your own food um, in your backyard is another trend. Um, a range of agricultural activities and product sales have already been allow in residential areas from um, horticulture to livestock to hobby farms and so forth. Um, new to the bylaw is the allowance of chickens and bees in a number of zones subject to conditions on parcel size and the number of animals uh, in order to control um, neighborhood conflicts. So there are a few new provisions to support energy efficient buildings and climate change ad uh, adaptation um, in a small way. Um, so building floor area calculation will not include uh, exterior walls so that building can, be, uh, can have thicker walls and better insulated walls, which are common practice in, uh, in passive houses. Um, building height limits will not uh, apply to renewable uh, energy devices such as green roofs, uh, solar panels, and wind turbines. And waterfront setback of 50 meters will be consistently applied to all area of the bylaw to enhance protection from flooding due to climate change and to enhance protection of the marine environment. And the new bylaw makes cannabis regulation more clear in light of the legalization of cannabis. A land use distinction between medical and non-medical cannabis production is removed. Um, cannabis retail is only permitted in commercial zones. A rural parcel size requirement are updated to reflect different types of cannabis production. And the regulation is consistent with uh, regulation of the agricultural land reserve. Uh, the new bylaw updates alignment with a range of legislations and uh, policies. And all the updates I just uh, presented um, are reflective of the current federal, provincial legislations and local policies to some degree and along with other technical alignments in terms of uh, in terminology and reference. So we have also done quite a bit of uh, technical house skipping and formatting to the bylaw to make the bylaw more technically uh, consistent and usable. Uh, terminologies and definitions have been updated for better uh, clarity and accuracy Format has been enhanced to make the document easier to navigate for a wide range of people from uh, residents to professionals. And so moving forward to the next steps of the process, staff will provide a summary report of the public consultation uh, in, this phase, uh, and, uh, in this phase of the process, along with recommended revisions to the bylaw for the board to consider second reading. Then a statutory public hearing uh, will be held, which will be the final opportunity for public input. And after that, the board can make decisions on um, final reading and adoption of the bylaw. And looking further uh, to the future, SCRD will continue to work towards uh, comprehensive new zoning bylaw and other planning policies. And that uh, wraps up my presentation. So I turn it back to um, Jonathan.
Thank you, Yuli. Okay, so what we're going to do now, I see we've got about 27 participants on here, is we're going to go into a question and answer period um, because tonight is a night where we want to hear from you about what you think and, and what sort of concerns that you have uh, moving forward, the type of things that you'd like to see. Uh, now that the bylaw has been out for first reading for a few weeks, um, we're hoping that people have had a chance to sort of take a look and with you, these presentation have some questions for us and things to consider as we move this bylaw forward. I'm going to turn it over to senior planner Julie Clark uh, to uh, inform everybody about how the speakers list will work tonight. Hello everyone, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Our apologies again from Field Road. We had a few technical difficulties up here, so I really appreciate your patience at the beginning there as we got going. Um, you might be able to see on your screen that we have a speakers list up here as a way of uh, helping you see your names if you wish to speak. And so how we typically run these meetings is that um, we have turned the chat off, I'll say. And how we typically do this is if you have a question or would like to make a comment, we certainly welcome that. That's the reason that we're here tonight. Um, you can raise your Zoom hand and we have, uh, um, there are a few colleagues here in the room with me who are managing the Zoom background. They will add your name to the speakers list, which you can see some names popping up there now, I hope. You'll probably only see the top three. Uh, and as, as we go through the speakers list, the names will scroll up. Our intent here is to give the opportunity for as many people to speak as possible. So we're suggesting three minutes as the time for a question, which our team will do our best to answer. And then um, after that, three, you'll see a timer countdown from three minutes to help us all sort of stay on track. And then we ask that if you do um, have a, a second question that's unrelated to your first one, you're welcome to add your name to the list again, but we'd like to get through the, the list of speaker the, for everyone to have a chance before we add names on a second time. Uh, so our team will keep track of that in the background here. And, um, and Jonathan and, and Yuli will do their best to, to uh, answer questions or link off to one of us if we're better suited to help answer that. And um, we'll remind you if you get a, a little close to the end of your three minutes and we need to move on. Uh, we are in a webinar format. I think uh, we might not have mentioned that at the beginning tonight. So right now you're just seeing the staff team on the screen. And when it is your turn to speak, we'll bring you into the webinar. If you wish to turn your camera on, you're welcome uh, to do that. We'd love to see your face. Uh, and if not, that's okay too. Turn your audio on and, uh, and, and share your question or your comment with us. Uh, so go ahead if you do. We have a few names up there. If there are others who have questions, please raise your Zoom hand and uh, I'll pass it back over to Jonathan. All right, thank you. As we wait the first question, um, just a reminder, we have uh, four staff. Well, we actually have six staff on tonight, um, but four of us are here to answer questions. So it'd be myself, uh, Jonathan Jackson, the manager of planning, senior planner, Yuli Sao, Julie Clark, and planner Nick Copes will be helping to answer the questions as well. And so with that, I will uh, turn it over to the first uh, member of the public who has a question. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can. Uh, broadly, first, I would like to commend the planning department for this um, suggested changes. They are, all seem to be in really good uh, need of the community. It, it seems to be in the right direction. Thank you kindly. My question to you is that uh, you have increased the size of the auxiliary unit from 592 square feet to 969 square feet. Um, does it involve a, ca a cap of at least 2000 square meters of the land area? Or will you actually propose to have a pro rata system of somebody having smaller lots, say somebody who does not own 2,000 meter land owns 1,000 meters or 750 or 1,250, can they have a smaller auxiliary unit? That would be more broad based and more inclusive for, uh, to inc and it will also help the affordability of the, uh, and bring, increase the density as well. Uh, it has broad-based benefits if you actually remove the cap for 2,000 uh, square meters of land. So what are the thoughts of the planning department on that? Well, thanks. Uh, one last That's thing to consider is that the uh, septic technology has moved by leaps and bounds over the years. Um, 
stage two, uh, you know, um, t- um, the latest technology in septic actually allows you to have uh, smaller septic fields, which are just as efficient as the ancient big ones in the past. Thank you. Thanks, Vineet. Uh, perhaps I'll start out and I might pass it over to Senior Planner Sal after that to uh, sort of uh, help with some of the details. Um, in terms, I'll start out with the, uh, the septic concerns. Certainly something that we note, and as part of this bylaw, we had some pretty in-depth conversations with Vancouver Coastal Health, who is the, um, the referral group that we use for all subdivisions and development in relation to septic requirements. Um, essentially where we're at today is that they still require that 2000 square meter minimum in order for a property to be on a septic system. Um, of course, if a property is existing today that is less than that, um, there are septic solutions out there, type two and type three systems to help with that, as well as for properties that, uh, have trouble with PERC. Uh, that being said though, uh, at this time for the health requirements and the research that they have at hand, they are sticking with the 2000 square meter minimum for our subdivision sizes. Uh, so that has been one constraint of this bylaw and certainly looking forward to that. Some of the forward from that, I should say, some of the conversations that we've had with them uh, really involve SCRD turning and looking to more of a community sewer uh, model development uh, in areas that would be selected through future OCP updates to consider uh, uh, appropriate densities that would require them. So that would be one way moving forward. In terms of the options that we've looked at today, so one thing that we've done with all properties where a single unit um, dwelling is uh, permitted, uh, which in bylaw 310 is referred to as a single family dwelling, bylaw 722 will refer to those as single unit dwellings. They will all permit a secondary suite. So as in Yuli's uh, slide there uh, showed, that would be up to a maximum size of 55 square meters. Uh, which I think is 569 square feet and um, sorry, 569 or 598, somewhere in that range, um, 55 square meters. And um, so that will be permitted in all single unit uh, dwellings uh, that we have in the regional district, uh, which is seen as sort of a, a, a very broad solution to help bring rental units to the coast uh, in a legalized safe way that can meet BC building code. The auxiliary dwelling units at this time, as far as this bylaw is contemplated, is only looking at them where they currently existed. Um, and that was part of not um, toying with going into OCP policies at this point in time and ensuring that we're consistent with what's on the ground and not sort of redrawing zoning boundaries as part of this bylaw, but rather leaving that to the next phase. Um, so looking at increasing the size where they were already permitted and certainly having that on our radar for the future as we look at future planning exercises and various levels of infill in appropriate areas where we would consider um, possibly having that uh, in, in, on smaller lots or in more comprehensive ways. And I'll turn it over to Yuli in case there's some comment uh, that he has on anything I've missed. Uh, thank you, Johnson. I think, yeah, you covered pretty much everything. Thanks. So I, can I uh, go back and ask you uh, this? Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, it took four or five years for us to look at a small amendment to 310 and look at 722 now, and it's still not passed. So it, isn't it now the time to look at lots smaller than $2,000 or put it for further five years, 10 years down the can because the housing crisis is now and it can easily be solved if you allow smaller gran- uh, grandma suites on lots smaller than 2,000 square meters. And 2,000 square meters is actually a very big uh, piece of land. In uh, Metro Vancouver, I know friends who own 2,000 square feet of land and they are building homes there. So it should be looked at now when we are looking at the other issues as well, rather than putting it further, pushing it uh, further down for another five, 10 years. Thank you, Vineet, and, and understanding the, you know, the urgency in terms of the housing crisis and trying to get options on the ground, it's certainly something that we're looking at doing. One of the challenges is, is with a bylaw that is um, affected, um, or sorry, well, it is responsible to sort of uh, be consistent with six OCPs, um, creates a bit of a challenge in terms of ensuring that we are making changes that are consistent with all of those OCPs. Uh, some of the future planning work that we have planned um, over the coming few years 
we'll certainly dive deeper and, and look into where it's appropriate to increase that infill. It is a bit of a larger community conversation to make sure we hit the mark right and get um, the density in the right locations. And it's something that we are eager to undertake and we'll be working on conversations um, with our board and with the community uh, to ensure that we sort of hit that mark and do so in a timely fashion. Um, ultimately bringing those changes forward. We're not exactly sure um, whether it will happen in phases or whether it might be a larger, bigger project, but certainly something that's on our radar and up for, for discussion. Um, ultimately, as soon as this bylaw um, is sort of across the finish line, we'll start to turn our attention to those next phases so that we can start to those next pieces. Um, but in order to get this bylaw across the finish line in a timely fashion, it was important that we didn't get into OCP amendments as part of it. Um, it helps to ensure that it can sort of move forward quickly without sort of getting into those deeper levels of consultation that's involved with amending official community plans. But certainly appreciate the comment and noted in something that we will be taking note of. Uh, one of the things I should add tonight is that as part of this community conversation 4722, what we're hearing tonight, things that we might not be able to address as part of 722, we certainly will be adding to our list of things to put at the top of the pile for the next round of community consultation as we do our future planning work. So thank you. Thank you kindly. Thanks, Vineet. So it looks like our next speaker is C. Hull. Hey there, thanks guys. Um, my name is Justin, my wife is Krista C. Hall. Um, Got to commend you, you for the work you've done so far. This looks all very positive. Um, it's a tough job I expect for you guys because you have a lot of people that move there for the NIMBY aspect, like, or not the NIMBY aspect, that was rude, like this, the being, being uh, in quiet, um, spatial, you know, a kind of a, a quiet area. And then you have, um, but then you also have a lot of people like us, like younger that want to like move and have like community and, and restaurants and, and, uh, and sense of community and not be like so isolated. So you, you're, you're walking fine balance. My question, and you're going to get a lot of questions I, I expected that are like central to each person, but that's the world we're living in, in terms of like what we're looking at. Uh, it's one thing I just haven't gotten clarity on. So we have uh, uh, R one zone. Uh, over 2,000. Yuli, I've emailed you a few times. Thank you for your quick responses all the time. Um, I'm still not clear though about the auxiliary building versus the auxiliary dwelling. So we have um, an existing auxiliary building that was built about 30 years ago with a, uh, a loft space up top. I'm just unclear about how we can use that within the framework of this bylaw. Um, we want to be able to finish it and you know, have guests stay there. Uh, perhaps um, as a short-term rental, if, if permitted, but we don't know the distinction between the building and the dwelling. And I'm just hoping for some clarification on, on that land use. Yeah, certainly. I, yeah, thank you for the question. So I could certainly answer your, your questions. So yes, um, so what the, uh, an auxiliary building is a building that is not meant for um, some people to, to live in it. Um, and auxiliary dwelling is meant to be a place for, for habitation. So in your situation, if you already have a living space uh, on top of an auxiliary building, um, then and it looks more like um, a carriage house situation. And, um, and, and in the new bylaw, the carriage house will be uh, permitted. That, that means the auxiliary um, dwelling will be permitted to be attached to any, any building. So, um, so you could either um, to con convert that space to a auxiliary dwelling, um, uh, along with um, your auxiliary building um, as one building together, or you can have you can build a separate uh, auxiliary wow. uh, dwelling. Um, so you can build a third structure. Do you want to ask? Oh, you're off mute. Oh, I'm off Did mute. I... Sorry, we're trying to sort this out between us. Sorry, he, I'm off mute. Brutal. Um, anyway, so that means um, an existing building, uh, auxiliary building, if it has a living space above it, sounds like it's going to be permitted if it's over 2,000 square meters. Is that what I'm gathering? Yes, that's correct. Oh, In our way, 
thank, thanks, guys. That's my, uh, or is it? We have a minute it, left. No, it's Krista here. I'm Justin's wife, just trying to follow the conversation. And, and um, I'm not sure that I'm clear on the distinction between a carriage home and an auxiliary dwelling. Can you just specify the difference between the two, please? Well, yes. Um, so a carriage home is just a common term for a, a living space that is on top or attached to a garage. So basically it is the auxiliary dwelling is basically it has a dwelling um, that it could be attached to any other building. You could call it a carriage house or you can call it a garden suite or a garden um, cabin, whatever you like to call it. So in the new model, there, there's no restriction for it for the auxiliary dwelling to be attached to a building. Whereas in the old bylaw, um, you cannot do that. You cannot uh, attach a auxiliary dwelling to a garage. But that... Um, uh, the definitions of the language are very clear now. Thank you so much for helping us understand the difference between the two. Thank we're clear. No more questions. Thanks, Great. guys. Excellent. Thanks for that, Yuli, and, and thanks for the question, Justin and Christy. Um, I just also want to add to that as well uh, that within the bylaw, though, there are the size limits. So there is, if, for example, the carriage house would be attached to a uh, auxiliary building, uh, whether it's for a shop or a garage or just storage, um, there are still size limits, um, depending on the land size, typically that vary. Uh, for those auxiliary buildings. So your total floor area would still have to fit within the allowances for each, both the auxiliary dwelling use separately, which would be the 90 square meters, and then whatever your allowance is for the auxiliary building, the total area of those would still have to meet the bylaw. So there's a much more flexibility than there was there in the past, but there is still some constraints. It's not sort of uh, a carte blanche sort of just sort of do uh, as much building as you want and call it an auxiliary building. And there are some limits in there to make sure that those are still within a sort of a size limit that fits the, the nature of something that's auxiliary to the principal building on the lot, just to clarify that. But thanks for the questions, great questions, thank you. All right, next up, I think we have, do we have someone else named Justin again or is it uh, Kevin who's up next? No, you have another Justin, another Justin. Um, on the call whose wife is actually called Karen. It's kind of bizarre. There's Justin oh. and Krista and Justin and Karen. Anyways, uh, just a couple comments. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, I appreciate your comment, which wasn't my question around, you know, where do you put density? Um, and, um, you know, I think if you look at the housing crisis, building potentially carriage homes or secondary dwellings on properties, it's maybe not the most cost-effective way to build density, maybe good income generation for the property owner. But my real question is around um, the rights that you're thinking of granting um, that you've described. And the thing that didn't seem to be included, which I think based on the communities that you're representing here, is the comment around the look and feel of our neighborhoods. And what I worry about as I've seen some of the developments over the last little while, is if you allow secondary dwellings, farming, are we gonna see an increasing level of land clearing, plastic tents, crummy second dwellings because they're quick to put in? So what I worry about is the balance between being flexible as a community for some of these ideas that you have, but maintaining the look and feel of what makes our community what it is, which is heavily green, rural, treed, and what's the right balance there? And, and so I'm wondering, as a takeaway, how you balance that out so that if my neighbor decides to build a bunch of um, tent hothouses to grow tomatoes to sell, that I have to then look at that, which I don't consider to be in the in line with kind of the community look and feel that I live in. And so I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that balance, which I think you touched on and how you factor that into the increased grant of rights to property owners, but balancing a broader sense of what the community's after from a look and feel perspective. So that's kind of my, my thought. Well, thank you for the question, Justin. That's a, a really good one. And it's certainly the, 
the fine line that we're trying to walk here in the planning department to sort of find that right balance on what we can do now under the existing OCPs and what needs to wait because we need to have those larger, deeper community conversations about who we want to be as the Sunshine Coast and what each electoral area wants to do in terms of sort of its own flavor, if you will, of how it might want to differentiate from others, but how we also have sort of a larger parent sort of set of principles as sort of one Sunshine Coast moving forward to address uh, some of the big issues before us, such as climate resilience and the housing crisis. So that's where we've gone uh, and looked at sort of things that are a little bit more out of the box solutions in terms of what we have permitted already in the existing OCPs, uh, which would be, for example, single unit dwellings. And it's quite commonplace and it's become quite commonplace both in BC and throughout the country uh, that secondary suites have become sort of a common thing that occurs within a single unit dwelling. And the BC building code uh, has um, detailed provisions on how those can be safely done. And so doing so without sort of, you know, significantly changing the look and feel of the neighborhood, it's something that short of perhaps, you know, another family living in that home and maybe another car or two in the driveway that isn't a sort of a significant shift. Right. And so yeah. that's one. The auxiliary dwellings, that's certainly where we sort of struggled to try and find that right balance. I know there was right. many conversations of anywhere sort of looking at it. There was sort of a, a large call for an increased size in the auxiliary dwelling. Yeah. But the, the, the community conversation as to what the right balance was in terms of size seemed to vary. We heard things from 800 to 1200 square feet, for example. So we've landed somewhere in the middle with 90 square meters, which is 969 square feet. And that's sort of reflective of trying to find a balance with a bit of a moderate increase, but not actually significantly turning the dial in a way that does warrant that deeper community conversation through diving back into our official community plans, uh, which is something that we know that we have to do, but we want to make sure that we get it right when we do that. So it also doesn't look at introducing those auxiliary dwelling units where they're not currently permitted. That was another piece of that as well. That again is right. sort of more the OCP piece. In terms of the land clearing, certainly it's something that we've been noticing on the Sunshine Coast and it's come with development. Um, certainly deep concern where it's been happening outside of the rules that we have in place. But that's certainly something that we're monitoring too. And at the beginning of the conversation, when I was talking about sort of what this bylaw is sort of looking to achieve, it is looking to sort of tweak and, and dial things in with the existing policy framework that we have. But we know in terms of development process that there is bigger community conversations that have to be had as part of bringing different types of development to the coast. And some of that will look at what we're doing in terms of how we manage sort of the clearing of land through development. Those are sort of some of the development process pieces that we have on our agenda uh, to look at uh, as soon as this bylaw is sort of across the finish line, it's sort of one of our big ticket next items is to really think about how we do development on the coast, where we can do better in terms of finding efficiencies, make things easier and more streamlined, but also where we can make them more strict in terms of sort of what is permitted, how it's permitted right. and clarity to the development community and the community as a whole in terms of what the expectations are around development. So that is a big piece that we are, are looking at as one of our immediate next steps. When we talk about sort of the next, say, five years after this bylaw, uh, looking out, there's certainly a lot of work ahead of us, uh, both as a planning department, a regional district, and as the community as a whole, uh, working together and collaboratively to find that sort of right balance to where we need to get to. And that will probably happen in some phases. We may see some things that take a little bit more time and some that are, are sort of done a little bit more piecemeal as we know that there's a need and we can produce something, we'll certainly be looking to do that. Looking at our development process is one of those sort of front loaded pieces that we really want to address. So that is top of mind with the planning department. I know SCRD board as well has also had conversations around this. So it's something that we're, we're, we will be looking at as well. I'm hoping that sort of helps to address some of your questions. I know it's- Yeah, not no, no, that, no, those were, were great and, and helpful. The only thing I would just close in saying is uh, in particular on development. It's not that I'm anti-development, but I lived in a community uh, in the past where the developers outpaced the government agencies that wanted to ensure the look and feel of a neighborhood. And by the time they got through their process, it was too late. So 
I just encourage you to have a real sense of urgency to prioritize that before we lose the look and feel of our neighborhoods. Well, thank you for that comment. Um, we yeah. do have uh, Genevieve Fix in our planning uh, office assistant on tonight who's taking diligent notes. Yeah. And we really do appreciate these comments because these actually sure. will help to form not only possible changes that we might look at as part of this bylaw as it moves forward closer to the finish line, but also what our next steps are um, as a planning department, how we can best serve the community moving forward. So these sort of comments are helpful because we can sort of help prioritize uh, what we're hearing from the community and where we need to sort of draw our attention to first. So we really do appreciate those comments because it is a difficult balance to try and find yeah. the ways to get the housing on the ground, but also make sure that it happens in a way that maintains all the values that we hold dear as a community here. on this Right, planet. exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, it's Julie here. I'm just popping in from the boardroom. I wanted to also acknowledge and thank, we've got several elected directors listening in this evening. And while you can't see their faces here on the screen, I want to acknowledge and thank uh, Chair of the Board, Darnell the Seegers, who is listening in tonight, as well as Area B Director, Lori Pratt, as well as Area F Director, uh, Mark Hilt. So thank you very much for being here and, um, and for listening to your community. Uh, so next up, uh, we have Kevin. Hi, thanks for having me and uh, thanks for the great presentation. I, I've read through the um, um, proposed bylaw and I was, I'm not sure if I saw it or not, but is there some form of a provision for restricting the use of the enlarged auxiliary uh, dwellings to um, uh, full-time residents only or are they going to be, um, per, is there going to be a permitted use as a vacation or short-term rental? Thank you, Kevin. That's a great question. So, certainly something that we um, muddled with as we tried to think about what these would look like and what they're trying to achieve for the community. So with that, uh, we did put provisions in there that basically what it does is today, if you have a existing 55 square meter um, auxiliary dwelling unit, it's typically either sort of a one bedroom or a studio type format. So it, it fits with the provisions of what is allowed in a, in a, in a short term rental or bed and breakfast. Um, so those have been okay in the past. We recognize though very quickly that going up to something that's starting to, to brush on a thousand square feet, 90 square meters, you're now in a form that you could do a three bedroom type of, of unit. Uh, which is really a family oriented unit. What we didn't want those becoming was sort of the, the no one party houses that people have talked about through the short term rentals as being a problem in the community. So through that, what we've done is we've limited so that if you have a auxiliary dwelling unit, which you could still build today at 55 square meters or less, it can be used as a short term rental as proposed in the bylaw. But if it's bigger than 55 square meters, so if it's one that's built under the new provisions and you decide to go bigger than the 55 square meters, anywhere between 55 and 90, it would not be able to be used as a short-term rental. So it does state that in there. And that is intended to really orient those towards being uh, for families to grow in place and also to provide rental opportunities. Okay, and, and would the same provision apply to the new allowance for, um, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, well, in, in house, in home suites. Yeah. So the, basically what it will allow, and I'll, I might lean on Yuli a little bit for this particular detail as well, but the, the, the secondary suite would be permitted in conjunction with also a short-term rental. So the idea is, is that you could have the secondary suite and it protects that sort of as what it would be a secondary suite, but still have the short-term rental. I might lean on Yuli here for a little bit more detail on that if I've missed anything. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, so the purpose for allowing a secondary, secondary suite in a single unit uh, dwelling is to provide that type of housing choice, which is for a very small uh, living space. So it is not in, it's intended to provide a long-term residential use rather than um, for um, short-term rental. 
Um, so short-term rental will not be permitted in a secondary suite uh, we, as we discussed, but um, it, a short-term rental could, can still be provided within the single unit dwelling uh, where it also could uh, contain a secondary suite. So I hope that helped to clarify it. I, I wonder, that does clarify things. I just wonder if that instance could become a loophole for people to utilize. And I would imagine that the uptake on secondary suite construction will be much higher than the secondary dwelling um, as it would be much less expensive and possibly just as um, uh, um, uh, well, a, a greater, just as great a revenue generator for someone wanting to rent um, a suite out for uh, whatever whatever purpose it is. Period. Um, would the bylaw department be able to address the use, and would there be covenants on these pieces of construction, or? Um, would we just be relying on the bylaws being there and people complaining about uses um, or illegal uses by their neighbors? Good question, Kevin. Uh, so because the SCRD lacks the legislative authority from the province to uh, have business licenses, unlike our incorporated partners at the town of Gibsons and the district of Seashelt who can issue business licenses, we do unfortunately rely more on enforcement uh, when it comes to the bylaw and short-term rentals. So the bylaw is there and it's in place. Uh, it hasn't been envisioned that we would require covenants to be registered at the time of construction. Those can get difficult to manage. And at the end of the day, in terms of enforcement, really it, it's, it's, it's a similar sort of outcome in terms of having it in the bylaw clearly and having a covenant on title. The only thing that would really do is be an additional signal to a future purchaser um, that, you know, something is permitted or not permitted. So we do rely on the bylaw to stand um, and people to essentially follow it in good faith. And then obviously if there is a problem that's reported to us through our bylaw enforcement team, um, they act with due diligence to investigate the complaint and find out if they feel that there is a bylaw infraction or not, and then deal with enforcement on a case by case basis from there on in. So that's, that's how we, we are, are set up with the province to operate in terms of our ability to, to deal with enforcement. So the hope was too, is in terms of how we've provided the regulations is it's really trying to be clear and intentional about what's permitted and not, but also still allowing people to have, for example, as Yuli mentioned, the secondary suite, but still have elsewhere within their single unit dwelling, the ability to do a short-term rental. Part of that is with the mindset of trying to encourage that the secondary suite is actually used for what it's intended to be used for and not taking away their ability to say, for, for example, rent out a bedroom um, during the summer months or something like that to help, um, you know, provide sort of a short-term rental sort of opportunity. Does that help to answer your question? Yeah, I think that about answers it. Um, th thank you very much. Um, I don't think I have anything else to say. All right, well, thank you, Kevin. If you do have any more after tonight, either you can have a second round of questions or feel free to uh, get in touch with us through our next talk page. Thank you. Great, thank you. It looks like our next speaker is Lucas. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yeah, okay, so thanks, uh, thanks for the great work. And actually my question is also regarding the definition of short-term rental. And I'm, I have to admit that I'm not the kind of guy who reads by laws every day. So um, I think in, we need a little bit more clarity on what short-term rental is, because here's like as a bed and breakfast and it seems to me, you know, you're gonna rent a unit or not. But I mean, let's, let's name it like Airbnb, will it be that considered short-term rental? What if somebody, you know, it's, it's uh, renting the whole property in Airbnb, which you could do for, and technically only says 30 days, but if you rent it for two months in Airbnb, is that considered short-term rental? So um, so I just want a little bit of clarity, like, you know, putting a name to it and, and say, well, like, is that allowed? And if it's not allowed, 
should be more clear um, because the way it, it reads here is like, oh, you do it for commercial purposes. Well, I'm just doing it on the side. It's not my commercial intention. So I could say, well, it's not actually forbidden uh, or maybe it's the other way around. Um, so I just I just want to know if you, if um, somehow it can add more clarity um, or you can you know, add clarity to, to that explanation here. Well, thank you for the question, Lucas. Um, just a, a little bit of, I'll give a little bit of a high level sort of intro and then I'll pass it over to Yuli who actually was uh, the member of our team that helped to develop some of our short-term rental policies that we have in place in the bylaw. Um, at a higher level though too, one of the things that we have to consider is the Residential Tenancy Act and when it becomes in fact a long-term rental versus a short-term rental. So that is part of sort of the overarching framework that we have looked at in terms of how we define what a short-term rental is. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Lee, to sort of get into some of the details about how it works and, and hopefully we can answer your question. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, so um, the short-term rental regulations in the current bylaw was was um, updated uh, about a year ago. Uh, we had quite an extensive uh, public consultation process to, um, in order to, to reach those, um, to come up with those uh, regulations. So um, to, to help you to get some more clarity on what is permitted, not is not permitted. So a short-term rental, or you can call it a band breakfast is permitted in a, any a single, fam, a thing, single unit dwelling or a auxiliary dwelling. Um, but there is a limit of two bedrooms of that dwelling could be used for the short-term rental. Um, there is also the requirement of the um, a on-site operator. Um, the operator of the short-term rental must um, reside on the property when the short-term rental is uh, operating. Um, and also there, there will be uh, re requirements for uh, parking for the short-term rental units. And there are also um, requirements for signage and the provision of uh, water supply and sewage treatment for the, um, for the operation. Um, so I, I hope that helped you um, to have better understanding of the um, short-term rental. Um, yeah, it, it does. I mean, it doesn't really add much clarity, sorry, um, to, to what it says, because like, what if I, you know, have a two, two bedroom house, it's just the only house. And then I actually, that's my residence, but then I short rent it for somebody for a week and I go somewhere else. Um, I mean, technically I'm still the resident there. Um, technically it's only two rooms, um, but yet I'm allowed to do the short term rental. So um, some of these things that to me, um, yeah, I'm clear. Um, and I, I think they're open to many loopholes, uh, like Kevin was saying, and, and um, just, I, I think we could add more clarity to the bylaws so everybody's clear about it, uh, whether I'm in one side of the defense or the other. Um, because obviously from the other side, you know, short-term rentals are also good to bring a lot of economic activity to the, to, to the area because, um, you know, there's a lot of people who you know, may want to come for some days and if you don't have accommodations, they won't actually stay and spend money in, um, in, in, the, in the coast. So, um, so you know, the, a little bit of clarity will, will be helpful and um, just yes, I'm I'm struggling sure. to, have, to, to, to see that clarity in the bylaws itself. Um, um, just as just that's so all I was asking, um, and um, so and then besides that, I, I think the, the point that the, the first speaker made regarding the size of the lot, and I know you're not addressing it now, and I know the density is going to be addressed, you know, at a later point in time. I just want to second that, um, it's definitely something you guys should consider, um, you know, some sort of um, uh, scale saying, well. You know, it's a very clear call now of a 2,000 square meter lot, and then we increase the size. But what about some, you know, 1,500 square meter? Should we allow a 55 square meter home? And um, so, um, I know you're not going to address it now, but I just want to, I know you're making notes about this. So, um, I just want to say that it's actually a good thinking, especially if we want to address um, some of the, um, the, the concerns about housing. So, uh, yeah, just that second note. 
Oh yeah, thanks, thanks, thank you for your comments. Oh, actually, the the new bylaw is uh, is being made uh, more more clear to to help people to to navigate through. Um, so if you can uh, find the specific section on short term rental, and there is there's also definition for short term rental. Um, there will be a pretty clear definition and regulation for short term rental. And for your situation, if you have a pool, a two bedroom uh, house, yes. The two bedroom could be used for short term rental, um, but the only uh, requirement that you, yeah, the, the requirement you should be aware of that you have to have someone to uh, live on site to in order to run the, the short term rental. So, and thank, you. thank you, Lucas. I want to just uh, second the thanks for for your comments. Um, in terms of the ones looking forward into the future, uh, helpful. The more that we hear what the public wants, the more we can better sort of direct the compass of, of the next sort of phase of work that we do in that direction and, and come out uh, with some options and, and some consultation that will help to really further that conversation with the community and, and figure out the answers to it. In terms of the short-term rental too, just going to add, um, whether it's through letstalk.scrd.ca uh, <laughs> um, or through planning uh, at scrd.ca, please do get in touch with us if you have some other comments on that because we're happy to hear them. Uh, when we do develop these regulations, you know, we try and think of every different scenario from every different angle, but sometimes we miss one or sometimes something's not quite clear. We could do a better job. And if you have suggestions that would, would help us get there or something that's not making sense to you, we'd really appreciate that input um, on that detail bubble, because if there's something that we can do to clarify things further, uh, we're absolutely happy to try and include that in this bylaw. So thank you. Thanks a lot. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll make some notes maybe and I'll send it your way. Thank you. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, so we have uh, upcoming, we have Kim D. And then after Kim, we have Karen Webb. And at this point in time, that's the end of our uh, list of speakers who have spoken for the first time. So I'll just add a bit of a, a call out. If there's someone out there who has a question they've been sitting on and hasn't spoken yet, this is a good time to raise your hand. And for those of you who are putting your hands up for a second time, you'll see your names are on the list. They're coming up, but we do want to make sure that we give everybody a first chance before we move on to the uh, group of speakers who've <clears throat> spoken. Uh, so, Kim, over to you. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. And Kevin actually asked my question, which was regarding the guidelines around uh, the changes for secondary suites and auxiliary dwellings. So I'll just say thank you for that answer. And I will also support Lucas's comment around needing more, as much clarity as you can give us around what's allowed when and where, especially if we're relying on um, not business licenses, but actually neighborhoods to monitor how these things develop. Because I think the changes are really intended to improve housing, but in reality, what we see on, um, I don't know if you've looked at air D and D, not DNA, I mean, uh, what we see is like 500 short-term rentals between Gibson Seashelt, Gibson Seashelt and Half Moon Bay. And we don't see anywhere near that in terms of housing. So um, just clarity on what those changes are meant for and help for all of us to make sure that they unfold the way we intend them to, thanks. So no question, just a comment, thanks. Thank you, Kim, very helpful. Um, and the more we can hear, uh, the, a, duplicate a duplicate comment's always a good comment because then we know that we're hearing it multiple times. So uh, thank you for those. Thank you, next up we have Karen. Just bringing Karen into the room here, there. Hi everyone, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us tonight. Um, change of topic, I'm wondering if you can provide more information on the 15 meter setback from water sources. Uh, we actually live next to a creek and, and are very respectful of keeping that environment as natural as possible. So I'm wondering, first of all, what sources of water would fall under the new bylaw? And that 15 meter setback, what happens to hardscape items that are currently in place? Are they going to be grandfathered? Um, like, how will that be enforced moving forward? 
Um, we have a property on the Gulf Islands and they are no longer allowing uh, retaining walls and hardscape structures to be built within that 15 meters. And we have to look to natural means to prevent erosion. I'm wondering, is that what the SCRD is going to be looking to do in the future? So just any um, further information you can give about that setback would be helpful. Thanks. Thank you. And I think uh, I'll start out and I might also turn to senior planner Julie Clark as well uh, for some, some assistance on some of the details on this one. Uh, she's one of our experts when it comes to everything and anything riparian. So uh, essentially this setback uh, as, as it is today is actually in existence in Roberts Creek electoral area D. So this bylaw looks to make it consistent throughout the other electoral areas that the bylaw applies to. Um, it, it really comes about both from in terms of trying to protect from future coastal flooding, erosion, and also protecting marine and aquatic habitats as well. Uh, when you're against a creek or a lake um, or a wetlands, you are subject to various provincial regulations that actually force you to go through a process with a qualified environmental professional to determine um, where your setback may end up actually lying. And in some cases, it may actually be more than 15 meters. But the bylaw sort of trying to set a minimum uh, standard for that. Now, within there, you could do things certainly like we're trying to encourage revetment walls, which are actually proven to be more successful at, per at uh, protecting from long term erosion. Uh, and obviously, with these things, anytime a new bylaw comes into effect, I would just add that, you know, something that is in existence today would be grandfathered. It still would be legal in terms of its conformity because it was built during the time that a bylaw was in place that permitted it. So uh, if there's an instance where something's in place and it's maybe not meeting a setback or something like that, there's also various options. If for example, a addition or a change to that particular structure that wasn't conforming is required. So there's still ways to work within the system to ensure that things can continue to be um, maintained and upkept and even and even added on to in some cases. And I'm gonna turn it over to Julie uh, for a little bit more detail on this as well. Sure, thank you. Karen, I really appreciate your question. And I'm gonna take this opportunity to first talk about riparian areas that are next to a creek because they are considered in the province differently than um, areas that are next to the natural boundary to the ocean. And so linking back to an earlier comment as well around land clearing, it's a really important for, uh, for us collectively to understand the requirements around riparian areas next to creeks, wetlands, or lakes, any freshwater source. So the provincial legislation calls it a water course, and that essentially means any, any fresh water, whether it's seasonally running or full-time running. And the provincial regulations that SCRD is obligated to uphold is a 30 meter assessment area from either any side of a water course that's fresh. And that doesn't mean it's a no build area, but it means it must be assessed, like Jonathan said, by a qualified environmental professional to determine what the, the appropriate setback is. In addition, the zoning bylaw has a setback for buildings and structures, but that 30 meter assessment area is about land alteration and providing authorization for appropriate land alteration in, in those areas next to Creek. So your question is a really good one um, because that is an area where we're noticing needs more of our attention in, in our community. And so I'll just take this opportunity to, to recognize that regulation and our collective obligation to uphold it. And the prof we rely on uh, third party professionals called qualified environmental professionals to provide the guidance there. And what's different when you're talking about a uh, natural boundary or the setback to the ocean is um, that's the piece that's proposed to change in this bylaw. So when we're talking about uh, fresh water, uh, no big changes there in this bylaw. A few minor changes, but the setback to the ocean is the primary area where the change is occurring in this bylaw. In uh, four of five electoral areas, that setback was 7.5, and it's proposed to 
now be 15 meters to meet provincial best practices for setbacks to the ocean and is also part of our commitment to be allies in reconciliation as well because those waterfront areas are are known to be uh, significant for first nations in the province so there's ecological protection in mind, there's flooding, climate change and sea level rise in mind, and there's also uh, being good allies in reconciliation in mind for why that setback is being increased. I hope that helps. Yes, it does, certainly. So just to clarify, in terms of the ocean then, the 15 meter setback, if anybody was to build any hard structure or even natural vegetation within that 15 meters, they would have to get some kind of approval from the SCRD before that was allowed? Right now, that setback is proposed to be about buildings and structures, not about land alteration. Typically, land alteration is uh, handled through a different pro process called a development permit. And that is in place, that process is in place for two of our five electoral areas, uh, but not for the rest. So when it comes to land alteration, we also have some work to do uh, to bring our policies and our processes in line uh, for those other areas. Right, so I'm just trying to be clear here. So retaining walls even? Any of those kind of structures now would all have to be approved through the SCRD if they're within 15 meters of high tide, what's the, how do you determine where does, where's the 15 meters back from? Yeah, multiple questions there and they're both great ones. So the natural boundary to the ocean is, is also the parcel line, the boundary line between the private property and public land. And that's always determined by a survey. So 15 meters is back from that line and within that area, your question about retaining walls, there is some consideration right now for how to handle retaining walls because they are sometimes considered a structure and sometimes not depending on their height. So we would, you know, I'm happy to um, have this conversation offline with you as well if you have something specific you wanna walk through, but uh, the way the building department and the building code works is, with a structure that's over a certain height. It's considered a structure, it requires engineering and may be required a build, building permit. Uh, so there's multiple different scenarios there, not a quick and simple answer for you at this point. Um, but if you do have something specific, happy to chat with you afterwards about that. No, thanks. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm in full support of anything that protects the natural environment, especially next to our water uh, sources. So just one quick, one last quick question. I don't want to take up too much more time. Can you just talk about the cannabis production and the alignment with the ALR? Um, we have seen um, some cannabis growing operations on ALR land where there's been a lot of clearing of natural vegetation and they really don't fit with the farming community that is set up around it. Um, it seems like perhaps they should not be allowed on that land. They should be in industrial zones rather than agricultural zones. Can you just talk to that quickly? Um, uh, yes, thank you for the question, Karen. Um, so I, I can uh, answer the question. Um, so uh, cannabis um, production is considered a farm use in the agricultural land reserve and it cannot be prohibited by uh, the local zoning. Um, so what we have done in the zoning bylaw is to make the, the alignment of the, the local zoning bylaw with the, with the agricultural land reserve regulation um, to, to um, specifically um, allow cannabis production if it is um, um, in an open field outside or within the building that is considered consistent, uh, is consisted entirely of soil. So those are the two main criteria. Um, so the, the alignment was, was made to be consistent, consistent with AR um, regulations. Um, and also there are um, um, zoning, um, the different zones that may permit uh, cannabis. For example, most industrial zones permits 
cannabis production and some rural zones when the parcel size is over a certain size and, and it, will, it will permit different types of cannabis production. For example, to, um, from standard uh, production to micro or nursery um, productions. Thank you, Yuli. Uh, I see Julie's got a point as well there on that. And I'll just follow up with one more detail on that too regarding the ALR. And so really what we're trying to do here is in being consistent both with the Agricultural Land Commission's um, um, regulations around ALR lands, but it's also about protecting that soil base so that that uh, that thin sort of layer of topsoil that takes hundreds of years to form good arable lands and it's trying to protect that. So versus having sort of the industrial type of building that you know, someone may try and build and sort of call it agricultural. So we're trying to push the, the sort of more industrial factory version of um, cannabis production to industrial zones or, or appropriate rural zones of, of parcels of the proper size rather than on agricultural land reserve land. So while it could be in a building on agricultural land reserve land, it would have to have a floor of dirt. So you could have the structure to support the walls and the roof uh, to sort of create like the greenhouse, for example, that you might want to help grow them well, but it would have to be a soil based um, building that does not have a proper foundation floor. So that's the intent of the regulation is really to protect that soil base that the Agricultural Land Commission is trying to protect through the ALR designation. And Julie, did you have anything to add to that? Just one piece, and maybe it's addressing the concern around land clearing that Karen was expressing. Um, when uh, land clearing is done for the purpose of developing a farm use, it's a use that um, that is uh, permitted through provincial regulations that SCRD cannot prohibit. Um, so we do see land clearing in agricultural land commission land that's specifically for farm use that uh, we are not able to regulate. Thank you for uh, taking my questions tonight. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Thank you for bringing your questions. Okay, that looks like we're at the end of our first set of speakers. Uh, so I'll do, I think Kevin has spoken once already. Yep. Do, I'll just do one last call for anyone who hasn't spoken yet before we move on to our second set of speakers. Awkward pause. <laughs> okay, we have Kevin first and followed by, uh, looks like Justin and Krista. Hi again. Um, I, giving what I was asking some further thought, I wonder what the original objective of changing the size of the uh, allowable auxiliary dwelling unit was. And um, was it not considered, um, well, is this mo movement for auxiliary, additional auxiliary dwellings uh, or larger ones, as well as additional um, uh, auxiliary suites or uh, extra suites, in-home in suites, will this not possibly cause an explosion in the, in the vacation rental movement that's already embedded here? Good question, Kevin, and thank you for asking it. Um, I, I tried to touch on this earlier, but maybe I didn't make it clear, so I'll try again. Um, when it comes to the larger auxiliary dwelling units, uh, it is specifically written into the zone, uh, the proposed zoning bylaw, that if it is exceeding the existing 55 square meters, it's allowed under bylaw 310. So if you take advantage of the extra square footage that will be per, is proposed to be permitted through bylaw 722, it wouldn't be permitted to be used as a, as a vacation rental or short-term rental. So it's, it's intended to protect those for, for rental purposes. And that's the intent of having that regulation in there. Also a secondary suite, um, they're being introduced, but you could still have elsewhere in your single unit dwelling a short-term rental. So that's more of a bit of a carrot sort of zoning solution where it's sort of saying you can have your secondary suite and then you can still have the short-term rental. So we're not saying that by having a, 
uh, a secondary suite that if you want to rent it out as a vacation uh, Airbnb sort of thing during the summer that you would be trying to evict your tenant. The, in, the point is, is to try and encourage that you can have that secondary suite and still have within the bylaw regulations under short-term rentals, the opportunity to still have a short-term rental on your property. So that's, that's what we've tried to do. Yuli may have a little bit more to add to that. Hoping that answers your question, but if I can't uh, answer it tonight, certainly we're happy to follow up with you as well. Um, yes, thanks, Jonathan. So uh, what I, I would like to add is um, that the reason for um, increasing the size of the auxiliary dwelling units um, was because through the previous consultation, the community asked for it. And, and because the existing limit of 55 square meters is too small to be able to accommodate uh, a family, um, it, it will be suitable for say a studio a small one bedroom space but it is um, a bit too small for um, a bigger family so that's the reason for uh, for its increase to uh, 90 square meters um, to be able to um, provide a moderate kind of mid-range uh, type of housing option for uh, for people yeah i i think the idea is great and i think the size is appropriate for um, more affordable rentals for long-term um, residents here however i i'm not so sure that you have anything in place that will ensure that the, the, those additional larger units will be rented by uh, people who need housing here and not going to the vacation rental market. Um, I used to live in Whistler and um, employee housing with covenants on those homes um, were monitored from time to time um, to ensure that people uh, were not renting out on a short-term basis for um, in a very highly lucrative market. Um, and uh, to ensure that the the, the bed base for residents was maintained on, on the long term. So I think something needs to be in place other than just um, a distant neighbor, um, you know, given it's a, a minimum half acre lot um, to, to, to make complaint about it. And who wants to complain about their neighbor's um, business? You know, it's uh, if you leave it to the neighborhood to complain, then the homeowner will know that it's the neighbors that are complaining, not, not the SERD. So it really, you know, makes it unfair for those who have to live next to it. Um, a two bedroom could accommodate four adults very easily, um, you know, and uh, who knows, maybe more. You can squeeze them in there um, in, in a thousand square feet. But uh, that's my concern. Um, and uh, I don't know what else there is um, on that note. Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I, I'm definitely a bit more clear on it now. You know, so certainly we have tried within the zoning parameters to ensure that the regulation intent is for it not to be used that way. It, it is how we've typically dealt with short-term rentals to date. Some good comments tonight, though, and I really appreciate them. And it is something that we will take back and discuss among staff and, and start to think about what other options we might have in our toolkit, such as a covenant, as you've mentioned, where maybe we can, we can do a little bit better in terms of trying to ensure these things are in fact protected for rental. Uh, the zoning provision, obviously is something that was sort of the, the first sort of notion with the development of the bylaw that certainly it needs to speak to that, that that is the intent of these. In terms of bylaw enforcement though, totally understand uh, the argument that it is difficult, you know, when you've got a neighbor, you know, they're not doing something right. You, you, you want to be a good neighbor and not, you know, be the person who's, you know, sort of calling the bylaws on them. But at the same time, you know, it, it does present a community challenge when someone's not acting uh, in accordance with the bylaws. So if there's something else that we can do in our toolkit, uh, certainly happy to take that back and take a further look at that. So thank you for those comments, very helpful and constructive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. 
Uh, I believe this is Justin and Krista. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, we actually put our hand down, but it uh, it still kept us on the list. So we have no further questions. So thanks again for all your work on this, and uh, have a good have a good night. Thank you. You as well. Vinit, you are next. Hello. Hello. So I, I, after asking that question, I was sent a uh, message, um, and I see that on your website, you've answered a similar question of somebody saying that Lot 3, Block 14, District Lot 8, 10 plan, they have a 16,000 square feet lot, and if they you know, can have a secondary dwelling or an auxiliary dwelling. And the answer says the parcel size threshold 2,000 square meters to permit an auxiliary dwelling has not changed, but a secondary suite will be permitted by the new bylaw. So can you uh, please elaborate what is the difference between a secondary suite and an auxiliary dwelling and what will be allowed in this new bylaw? Thanks for the question. I think Yuli's turned his mic on, so I'll let him take this one. Yeah, thank you for the question again. Um, so what I meant by the threshold has not changed. That means the, the basic, the general framework of the density of both the old and new bar have not changed. That means um, there are certain um, partial thresholds and for example, 2,000 square meters and 3,500 square meters, where a, a certain number of dwellings will be permitted. And in that case, uh, because that parcel is less than 2,000 square meters, therefore the auxiliary dwelling will not be permitted. So an auxiliary dwelling will be only permitted when the parcel size exceeds 2,000 square meters. Um, and I can also clarify again uh, the difference between an auxiliary dwelling and a second suite. So an auxiliary dwelling is um, basically is a dwelling that is permitted when the parcel size exceeds certain uh, size. Um, and, in, and in the new bylaw, the this, this floor area of the auxiliary dwelling is increased from 55 square meters to 90 square meters. Um, and the auxiliary dwelling can be attached to any building or can be a standalone building. Um, and the difference um, between a secondary suite and a auxiliary dwelling is a second suite, secondary suite is, has a smaller floor area, which is only 55 square meters. And it has to be the auxiliary use and be contained within a single unit uh, dwelling. For example, if you have your house, a house, a main house, um, you, you could have say one or two bedroom set aside to be a secondary suite, but this suite has to be in um, contained uh, within your house. So that's the difference, um, size, location, and um, yeah, so size and location, um, so that, that is the, the, the main um, difference. So I hope that um, helped to clarify this, um, your, your concerns. I will email you, thank you kindly. I think I get the idea, but I'll email you for further questions on this. Thank you, Vinny. And I had a look at the question online too there, and I see like, so, you know, 16,000 square feet, trying to do some rough math in my head, but it, it, I believe that would be less than 2,000 square meters. So in this case, under the bylaw, just to be clear with that specific example, nothing would change that would permit it to have a, a separate auxiliary dwelling unit, um, which under the new bylaw would be proposed to be up to 90 square meters. It wouldn't permit that, but like any lot um, that permits a, a single unit dwelling uh, under the zoning, under this new bylaw, a secondary suite, as you mentioned, contained fully within the building where an auxiliary dwelling unit can be a separate building or it can be a carriage house on top of a garage that's totally separate from the single family or single unit home. But the secondary suite will be permitted um, in all zones that permit a single unit uh, dwelling. So that would be eligible for that uh, as would all properties, uh, regardless of size, 
if they permit a single unit dwelling, but the auxiliary dwelling unit will only still be permitted where it was currently permitted, which is on lots and under, well, in specific zones and under uh, that permit it when it's, the lot is over 2000 square meters. Uh, so that won't change as part of this bylaw, but certainly something we've heard some good comments tonight and we appreciate them. Uh, that it sounds like there is an appetite to see this in other locations. And so certainly as part of future planning work, uh, we're happy to take that on and bring that back to the community in a way where we have those discussions about where it might be appropriate and in what cases. So thank you for the comments and, and please do follow up with us if you have uh, further questions and we'll, we'll try our best to answer them. Thank you. Thanks, I'll just jump in here and say Vineet was our last speaker so far for this evening. It's about 20 to nine. I've just added into the chat the Let's Talk SCRD page that is specific to this zoning bylaw. If you haven't already been in there, it's an interactive page where you can ask questions and the team that you've heard from tonight, as well as a few others who are in the room with me here, are responsible for um, answering those questions and we do it publicly so that everybody can see. Uh, so please, if uh, something pops to mind after tonight, feel free to add your questions there. The types of questions you've had tonight will benefit other people as well. So you'll see our team continues to respond. And we'll also post updates about the project there. So you uh, please watch there for, for updates. Uh, if there's anyone else who would like to put up their hand, now is the time. I'm also gonna to add to the chat um, an address where you can send us a message to ask a specific question about your property if you wish, or if you would like to become a part of a subscription list for this project in particular, where you do get an email blast when there's an update. Uh, we, if you send us a quick message to this email address, then we can add you to that list as well. Okay, and that way when there's something that's changing or another part of the process, you'll uh, you'll get an up, a personal update. I'm not seeing any other hands, so I, oh, I take it back. Ken, I see that you've joined us tonight. Thank you. It's actually Donna. Um, I Hi, was Donna. We had another meeting. Last night. I, Thank you I've only just back. joined uh, tonight, so I I wonder if um, some of the questions that came up last night at the elementary school were re reiterated tonight because this is recorded right and so i hope that those actually become questions that can be seen by the public who watch this youtube so i wonder if the issue of the size of um uh home-based business uh, the 20 percent came up tonight if the issue of numbers of chickens came up tonight and if the issue of flexibility or greater flexibility than is currently being provided in housing options came up tonight. And if not, I'd like to raise those now. Thank you, Donna, for the, the uh, bringing those questions up. Uh, great, we did have uh, some questions about the flexibility tonight, certainly. Um, it, it's something that we've heard loud and clear from the community and we're, we're really encouraged by the comments that we've heard both at tonight's session and last night's session. Uh, we didn't have the comment about the home-based business come up tonight, but certainly something staff did discuss that just for clarity for everyone listening. There was a comment um, related to a, a proposed regulation that was looking at having the floor area for a home-based business be limited to 20%. Um, of the total floor area of the that is on the property. So uh, it was raised to us last night that there are certain types of businesses. Um, uh, one example was a woodworking shop that require more space than that. And sometimes someone might have a very simple, modest home on their site and actually have a shop uh, that might be something like, you know, 800 or 1,000 square feet and comparable to their house in size. And so that this would be a regulation that would be overly onus for them to try and, and adhere to. Uh, and just want to reiterate that we are going to be looking at that. That was some really great feedback, exactly in line with the type of feedback that we're looking to have as part of this draft bylaw. Uh, and so we will take that into consideration and go back and, and have another rethink about how we can make sure that we're not making changes that would affect um, some of the many valuable home-based businesses that we have here in our community. Another question we had last night, as Donna mentioned, was around the number of chickens um, that could be permitted as part of the residential agriculture. And so this is something that certainly we've done a lot of um, 
thought of on. Uh, we've looked at best practices from other municipalities and local governments. We've had conversations with the Ministry of Agriculture around it. But we're also hearing things from the community um, that we really want to take into um, consideration in a meaningful way. I believe the bylaws it is, and if, if I'm wrong, someone please interject. I think it's proposing six chickens per property. Uh, if it meets that size, the, the, the smaller size to permit residential agriculture. And we heard last night that there was an appetite for more, uh, that six chickens might not be enough if you're really trying to raise chickens and, and produce eggs in a meaningful way. And so that's something that we are gonna take back and look at. And hopefully we can have some conversation further with the folks that spoke out the other night. Uh, because again, that type of feedback is really what helps make this bylaw better. And one that will um, help to address the needs of the community here and today. Um, we know there's a lot of big issues going on here on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, many of them are not just limited to the Sunshine Coast. Uh, many of them are province, country, and even global. Um, however, here on the Sunshine Coast, we do know uh, that we have you know, significant challenges in front of us related to climate change and building climate resilience in our community. Some of that from that um, comes is things like food security and the ability to work from home. These are all things that actually can be part of an overall climate solution, reducing GHGs from having to commute, um, having, having the ability to grow your own food on your site. These are all positive things for our community and help us build a more resilient community. And we also know that we do have a housing crisis before us, not just here on the Sunshine Coast, but in the province and in the country. And it's something that we are um, taking to heart. This bylaw, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, it can't solve it all. It's just not within the scope and the parameters of the bylaw. In order to really get into the, into the details of, of trying to find bigger, broader solutions, it involves getting into our official community plans, which is a bigger, more detailed community conversation. And it involves a lot of work with senior levels of government, nonprofit groups to help find those really robust solutions that will help get the SCR or the SCRD and the Sunshine Coast as a whole to where we need to be in terms of providing those housing solutions for our, for our community. So this bylaw is looking at trying to do what it can uh, within, its, within its parameters of, of the, the policy framework that it, that it is operating under. So it's sort of, for lack of a better way to describe it, trying to sort of grab the low lying fruit, the things that we know that we can make quick change with. And so things like that are the increased auxiliary dwelling unit sizes, uh, permitting secondary suites. These are some of the things that we know that we can do. There's regulations there. There's sort of the out of the box solutions that we can make happen quickly and efficiently. So that's where this bylaw has gone on those. And we, we, we've heard a lot of great comments from the community. I do wanna to continue to echo that what we've heard here tonight what we heard last night at, at Roberts uh, Creek Elementary School. Uh, we had about 40 people out last night. We got about 15, 16 members of the public on the call tonight. And it's really great feedback. I really want to encourage that people continue to reach out and talk to us through our Let's Talk uh, page, as well as planning at scrd.ca. Anytime, give us one of us a shout, come and visit us at the front counter. This type of feedback that we're hearing here tonight is exactly what helps build good policies for the community. It's what help builds community in itself. So we're really appreciative of everything we've heard tonight. And so I just want to, you know, echo my thanks. Um, it's really helpful to the team, to myself, to SCRD board to hear this type of feedback. So we do really appreciate it. And Donna, is there anything uh, more that you have? Yeah, uh, just what, just one more comment on the, on the thing about the chickens. I think that there was concern that the term poultry has been uh, replaced with chicken and many people raise other kinds of birds like ducks and geese. And so perhaps return to the use of the term poultry would be more appropriate and, and drop the word use of the word chicken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, is, that is good feedback and, and appreciate uh, hearing that um, something that we will take back. Um, there was, again, some really good comments that we heard on the residential agriculture portion last night and um, looking forward to trying to find some solutions to some of the comments that we heard. And that is one of the good ones. In fact, I must admit that um, I know I've had friends that have raised ducks and they're, they're quite cute. So and their their eggs are, are also a very high quality. So certainly something that we want to make sure that we're properly considering as part of this bylaw. So thank you. Donna, was there anything else? Or? No, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us again tonight. Really appreciate it.
Okay, this really is your final call. <laughs> we have no one less left on the speakers list. There are a couple of people who recently joined us, so this is the, uh, the final call for speakers tonight. Um, you will see in the chat that we left you a few different ways to get a hold of us when you do have another question or if you want to stay tuned with this project as it moves forward. I'm seeing no hand, so Jonathan, back over to you to wrap us up. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, we've heard a lot of great feedback over the last two nights and through this bylaw process overall. Um, we're really delighted and happy to bring it forward. It's an exciting piece of work and we're happy to hear a lot of the positive feedback that we've heard. Uh, and we're also really happy to take some of the feedback of, of areas that we need to make some reconsiderations. And so how this will work moving forward, just in terms of process, is uh, as with any bylaw, it will need to move forward with the various readings. It's got first reading right now. Um, and next, the next step would be a second reading with a um, full report back to CRD board on what we've heard through this round of engagement and any changes that have been incorporated into the bylaw as part of that engagement reporting back on those, but also echoing to some of the other larger comments that we've heard. And if they're not able to be included in this bylaw, then why they're not able to be and what steps they may actually fit into. So providing that piece of clarity back. Following second reading, would, well, sorry, at second reading would also be the recommendation for a referral to public hearing. And so at that point, that would be the next step for further community engagement. This has been a really important one because this is the time that it's really easy to make some good changes. So uh, it's not closed yet. I'll echo that. If you've got more comments, please email us, uh, visit our Let's Talk page, send us comments. We're happy to hear them and incorporate what we can. Um, and then when we go to the public hearing, we'll look forward to hearing more from the community and hopefully we'll have addressed many of the concerns that we've heard throughout this consultation, or at least been able to provide clarity on, on, on what the next steps would look like in terms of planning processes to address some of those concerns that we heard. And then following that, we're hoping to have adoption of the bylaw shortly after a public hearing, um, if it's in a place that the, that the board wishes to, to consider that. So that would be what the process looks like. Um, ultimately, we're hoping to get this file up and operational as soon as possible um, if, the, if the community is in support of it and the board is in support of it. So that would be where we're looking at. Um, again, once you know a bylaw is out and up and running to, if you have ongoing thoughts, questions, concerns, we're still happy to hear those. Um, the door is always open and we always invite to hear your comments because they are useful as we look at the next stages of planning work. So please, um, I really, really appreciate the whole team does all of the efforts that we've seen from the community uh, in terms of getting involved in this bylaw and helping us sort of muddy through some of the sticking points on it. Uh, it's really useful conversations to building a better Sunshine Coast and we look forward to uh, future engagement sessions with you as we work on some of the exciting projects that we're gonna have coming forward in the future. So thank you very much. And again, it's thanks to our elected officials that have joined us tonight. And I wanna wish you all a wonderful evening and we look forward to the next steps. And I think Julie has one more comment before we end. I was just gonna add my, my thanks and especially for, uh, for folks appreciation at the beginning while we sweated a bit with some technical issues. So thank you for your patience. And I will ask my team to stick on the line for a couple of minutes as we say goodnight to everybody else. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you, everyone.